Welcome back, all you scrunklies, to another episode of Video Game World Tours, a series where we slow down and soak in a game's environment. Today's tour takes us to the Mushroom Kingdom, as depicted in Super Mario RPG. After a short intro sequence, you're plopped into Mario's pad. A whole perilous journey lies before you, but right here are humble beginnings. Just the tiny little plot of land with Mario's house. There's something special about peaceful little areas near the beginning of an RPG. They're almost always super cozy. Like, is this really where Mario lives? Just a little hut in the forest? That's kinda cool. He has this tiny clearing all to himself. What does a day in the life of Mario look like? Does he have responsibilities? Does he tend to his yard? These are questions I never would have thought to ask about Mario, but now that I'm presented with his house, I suddenly find myself thinking about them. Having beaten the game and coming back here, it's like wrapping a bow on the whole experience. It's like poetry, you know, it rhymes. Now that Mario has saved the Mushroom Kingdom, he can chill out for a bit. I'd chill with him if I could. We'd just hang out and play Fortnite duos. I have to talk about the game's style. I've made it no secret that I'm a big fan of pre-rendered environments and games. They create super high detailed models on an insanely powerful computer, render those models out into an image, then place that image onto much less powerful hardware. It's basically cheating. I love it. Alongside that, you get some glorious late 90s early CGI. I'm not too knowledgeable about 3D rendering and how it's progressed since then. Maybe someone can chime in on the comments. You can just tell the difference between this render for Super Mario 64 and this one for Super Mario Sunshine. Super Mario RPG is a game built out of those iconic late 90s CGI renders running on the Super Nintendo, no less. We're seeing Mario in a completely different way than we're used to. In fact, we're seeing the Mushroom Kingdom in a completely different way. And not just from a graphical perspective, but a gameplay perspective. This is an RPG. This isn't just a visual novel. You can walk around and talk to people, meander around town, barge into people's houses. You actually get to see what the Mushroom Kingdom is like. That's something I definitely had on my mind when playing this for the first time recently. What was this like back in the day? The abundance of Mario RPGs today didn't exist back then. This was literally the first. Before this, it was just platformers and weird spin-offs. I have mad respect for this game for taking a foray into a new genre. In retrospect, it's a simple idea. Take Mario, take Final Fantasy, smush them together. But is it simple? Like, what would the modern equivalent of that be? Mario and, uh, XCOM, maybe? What would that even look like? I can't imagine them even trying such a thing. So, exploring the Mushroom Kingdom really is a treat. It's so cool just to be able to walk in someone's house and talk to them. Here's a little Toad family. I never thought that's something I'd want to see, but they're cute. Especially the kid upstairs, bouncing on the bed. He wants to out-jump Mario. If Mario concedes that he's better, he goes Super Sonic. He does have him beat there. Mario can't jump that fast. He can stand on his head, though. There's a toad couple planning on getting married. Isn't that just adorable? This toad tricks Mario into thinking he's standing in something. A lot of NPCs will change dialogue throughout the game, but I think this NPC doesn't change at all. This is their one gimmick. And I love him for that. And what do you say we actually explore Peach's Castle? Since Super Mario RPG came out a few months before Super Mario 64, this is the first time it actually appeared in a video game. It really does feel like a Final Fantasy castle. In a good way. It's super regal in here. The crimson pillars, red carpet, and the light shafts pouring in from outside. It's lovely. You can enter Peach's room. Not a whole lot going on in here. You can jump on her bed if you want. I don't think she'd mind. Over here is the guard room. 
Not a whole lot going on in here either. But if you come by at just the right point during the story, you can meet Samus. She's taking a nap before fighting Mother Brain. I'm stupid. I forgot to come in here at the right time during my playthrough, so hopefully this image will suffice. The Throne Room Man, this whole castle is pretty plain. Look at this throne. It's so sad. It's just a normal-ass chair. Might as well be a folding chair. Who knows, it might be super comfy. Before we leave the town, I want to point out how they didn't even care to hide the map's boundaries. The playable space abruptly cuts off into a blue void. Another charming part of the game's aesthetic. It's like a little playset. Marymore is a little town with a chapel and a hotel. A place exclusively dedicated to weddings. This is completely separated from all the towns nearby. You know this place is expensive. Well, I know it's expensive. You can choose to rest in the special suite, and it costs 200 coins. What's the chapel look like? Exquisite. Let's chat some people up. I get a gift if I stay in the special suite a couple times. Yeah, I don't think I'm gonna do that. This guy wishes me a happy life. That's nice. This kid's, uh, gone. The toad couple we were talking about earlier got married and went to some island. Oh, this lady says they went to the South Island. Why don't we go catch up with them? They're visiting Yoster Isle, an island inhabited by Yoshis. It's nice to see a bit more of Yoshi's Island after, well, Yoshi's Island. Oh, there's the newly married couple. Aw, Raz can't ride a Yoshi, but Rainy still loves him. They're truly made for each other. A Yoshi's favorite pastime is apparently racing. Their whole little society here is built around that. If you hop on capital Y Yoshi, you can ride him around, and even talk to the other lowercase y Yoshis. Racing really is a big thing for them. What a weird development for the character after Yoshi's Island. But honestly, I kind of like it. Though they never carried through with that into later games. I say, let Yoshis love racing. They don't have any other special traits. Give them that at least. They have these cute little gazebos dotted all over. Say, did the Yoshis build these? Have Yoshis progressed past the Stone Age? Hard to say. Oh, here's a little baby Yoshi. Honestly, I always hated these little weirdos. They kind of remind me of Scrappy-Doo, and now that I've said that, I hate them even more. But this one is special. If you feed him enough cookies, he'll grow into the infamous Big Yoshi. I won't do that though. I'll spare this world the unspeakable horrors of Big Yoshi. A good bit later, you come across Monstro Town a town inhabited by monsters. I love when RPGs give you a location with peaceful versions of the monsters you've been fighting for the rest of the game. Honestly though, I kinda wish this place was fleshed out a bit more. Most of the peaceful enemies here don't have a lot of flavor text to them. They just offer some utility, like directing you towards some secret. I do appreciate the novelty of this place just existing though. Like, it's cool to actually be able to talk to a piranha plant. This thwomp does have a little bit of flavor to him. I don't quite get it, though. He calls me the strong silent type and asks if I dig these vibes. What do you think life as a thwomp is like? Does he live here, or is he visiting his rat friend's house? Does he sleep in a bed? The floors of these houses are grass. That seems like it'd be a nightmare to take care of. I want to point out this screen as you're leaving town. I wonder why they put this here. Like here's the screen with the main town, here's the little room, and it leads you right into the world map. Why not bring you to the world map from here instead? There is a note that says thanks for coming by. I like that. These monsters have some real hospitality. Not long after Monstro Town, you leave the comfy ground and ascend into the sky. 
The pure blue backgrounds of nearly everywhere else is replaced with clouds floating by as you go higher and higher. Eventually, you reach your destination, Nimbus Land. A race called the Nimbus live here. Their homes are made of thorny roots for some reason. The insides of these buildings are so comfy. Like, I bet this is the most comfortable bed in existence. And rather than have a pure black background like most interiors, this is a darker blue. It's a little detail that sets this place apart from the other towns. There's this platform on the west side of town that doesn't see use for a bit during the story, so coming here before that, it's just a chill place to hang out. What's this guy have to say? Like and subscribe to support the channel? What does that mean? Let's visit the castle. It's actually a dungeon, so there's lots of rooms where you'll be fighting enemies, but once you beat the boss, it's just a normal castle. It feels so much more authentic compared to the castle in the Mushroom Kingdom. Like, it's super easy to get lost in here. This room is super cool. The king actually commissioned statues of your party for saving the town. In here's the throne room. Well, there's no throne, but you know what I mean. The king and queen just stand here, facing forward. I think that's all royalty does in real life anyway. Out the back door in the throne room, and down some winding hallways, you're led to whatever this is. Is this a balcony? Why is there no railing? I guess it does lead to the king's private hot spring. Does he take this route every time he wants to decompress after a long day's work? It is pretty chill in here, I'd probably do the same. Alright, let's visit some spots rapid fire before the final stop at my favorite location in the game. There's a little coin collecting mini game you can play at the Midas River. While you're going down this waterfall, you can enter a few caves and you'll be guided through. I like how all the enemies are here doing their own thing. It's like an amusement park ride and they're paid to do their little act. Kind of like I mentioned with Monstro Town, it's cool to see normally hostile enemies in a peaceful manner. You come across a mart ran by a guy named Hinopio deep inside some caves. At the back of his shop, you can find some F-Zero machines as well as an R-Wing. Cute little reference. Alongside Samus resting, like we talked about earlier, you can also find Link taking a nap in Rose Town. I like that the developers weren't afraid to reference other Nintendo properties. I feel like if this were a Nintendo-developed game, we wouldn't have seen this many direct references to their other games. But because this was made by Square, they threw in a few oddball easter eggs. Gives the game a lot of charm. In the sunken ship, there's a really bizarre room. You walk through the door, and it's normal at first. You see there's a little doorway to the left, so you walk towards it and... There's another Mario. This honestly struck fear into my heart when I first came in here. It's such an out of left field gimmick, I didn't know what to think. This dungeon isn't really themed around anything where this would make sense in context. It's what it says on the tin, just a sunken ship, not a magical funhouse. Even now, having beaten the dungeon and seeing everything it had to offer, I still don't get this room. But it's weird, and weird is cool. The last quick stop before the final area is just the background for the final boss. It's a hellish landscape made of the heads of the final boss's true form. Look at all these. What purpose could they serve? It's relatively spooky for such a lighthearted game. Alright, favorite spot in the game. But before I give mine, what's your favorite spot? Drop it in the comments. The whole plot of the game revolves around you collecting seven stars to rebuild the Star Road. The Star Road is where wishes are turned into wish stars before falling down to the planet, at which point they are granted. Those wish stars fall onto Star Hill. 
Star Hill is such a magical place. It feels like you traveled to another planet. The landscape, the mystical music, it's so otherworldly. The best part of this location is that you can read other people's wishes. Some are super mundane, like wish I had some cricket jam, but others are deeper. Can't wait to start a family. I hope my baby's cute. Say, do you think these are from the toad couple we've been following throughout the game? That's what I love about this. So many of these wishes you can actually track to characters in-game. If I could just get that melody. That's Todovsky, no doubt. You come across him a few times, and you can even play a song for him. I want to be a Valdeklas baker. Oh, that's totally one of the cooks in Marymore. It even has the accent. The hunger. Oh, for some food. I feel like I know this one. It's on the tip of my tongue. I just can't remember who. I wish I weren't such a crybaby. You know, Mallow is kind of a crybaby. I wonder if... Oh, it actually is him. He calls you out for reading his wish, but then apologizes. That's so cute. I love this little puffball. Wish I could run faster. That's Yoshi. Look, it even has the parentheses you usually see when talking to him. I like how this game gives Yoshi a little bit of character through this and your interactions with him on Yoster Isle. Final wish. I want to be a great plumber like my brother Mario. Oh man, that's just the best. Luigi only has a little cameo appearance during the end credits, but I love that you can find this. It's so cute that he looks up to Mario like that. This is such an amazing location. It's so charming that you get insight into characters you come across during your journey here. And I just love the overall driving force of the game being to save the ability for people to have their wishes granted. You see the story stakes by reading all of these. And having beaten the game, it's good to know that I played a part in making all these people's lives better. Check out either of these videos if you liked this one. On a side note, let me know what you thought of the CRT filter I used in this video. Not sure if I'll do it going forward, but I thought I'd try it out at least. Thanks for watching and see you next time.